You're live recording now. Okay. Hopefully, if anyone's online, let me know if you can hear me. There's two people in here. In the comments there. How's the audio? Hmm? Uh, let me see. the audio Can anyone hear me? Looks like I've got green lights working. Maybe not.
Hey, Zach. Great. Look, I've got a fancy new mic. It's just getting too much with my <laughs> mumbly Aussie voice. I needed better, better uh, sound. It does have a gain, so if it's uh, if it's quiet, let me know. I can turn it up. Awesome. Awesome. Just in the nick of time. Hey, Jason. I can see your message there. Are you doing an intro or should I just launch into it? Go for it. Okay. Wow, all of a sudden there's 36 people. Hey, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, uh, I'm uh, just getting set up for my Sunday. I'm at my little cabin uh, at Boston Bar which is hilarious. I should really, I could do a walk around video of this place. It's, it was, it's got bark wallpaper behind me there. And, uh, it's very nice. I'm here for a week to do some projects and, uh, yeah. Thanks Zach and Jason again for sorting out this conference. It's an awesome event full of, uh, 
good speakers and knowledge and sharing of uh, tiny house community stuff. So I appreciate you guys. And here's my presentation. I guess you can see it. It says 2021, but I ran out of time to, uh, to update it. So I will launch in. I think it's just a half hour um, talk that I've got here, but I think the time lot is an hour. So we can do some questions or I can take my time with it a little bit more. Um, okay. Let's make sure it works. There we go. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, what is a healthy home? Now this is different for everyone. And we'll go into that. Uh, and then some of the elements that, that we take special care with, um, in our environment here, which is the Pacific Northwest, thermal bridging, insulation, ventilation, electrical and material choices. So I'm going to go into those things right now Oop, in the other direction. So yeah, what's a healthy home? Um, for us, it's avoiding harmful ingredients. Um, the the uh, yeah, as in non toxic, as much as possible materials, or low VFC, which is volatile organic compounds, or electromagnetic frequencies, and we'll go into some of that electrical stuff, and then having great ventilation, as in the air quality inside is better than outside. Um, we used to say the same as outside or better, and now it's a little bit more that we're trying to do better. And that's got to do with uh, smoke. Like we've got sort of five seasons nowadays. Um, four we can count on and five is a moving target. But the fifth season being a fire season, um, for anyone who's in areas like that, I grew up in Australia and uh we definitely had fires all the time and now it's becoming the norm in the Pacific Northwest. So having filters on those ventilation systems uh, can create a better air quality inside than out. Um, also possible to filter out uh, pesticides and stuff if you're in a rural area. Um, existing allergies or sensitivities. This is kind of what got me into, into healthy homes building at the start. Um, it wasn't tiny houses right away. It was, uh, it was natural building. So I was in regular construction and, um, I had, and I don't think I showed a slide, hopefully not for you guys. It's a bit graphic, but the, um, when I was an apprentice in Australia, we, we, I had a toxic shock, uh, situation where we had a two part paint being put down on a, on a commercial uh, concrete floor. And my whole, my skin just exploded and had an instant uh, reaction, allergic reaction to the, to the fumes. And from then on, this new kind of paint smell just made my body not go right back to that violet um, reaction that I had initially, but my skin just crawling at the end of the day. And I kind of just persisted with it and dealt with it for 10, 15 years um, of being a tradesperson. Um, until, until I just was that. And a couple of other things was like, you know what? I just can't, I can't do this anymore. I went into natural building and that turned into earth ships. And then from that, I kind of came back into this tiny house building and, uh, and that's where I am now. And that's why I was non-toxic, I guess, to try and for my own benefit, just as much as anyone else's. Um, so my existing allergies are, are like this, um, volatile organic compounds, which is, you can, you can smell it when you go into a dollar store or Ikea or a freshly painted house. It's this kind of chemically smell. So avoiding them's uh, a big one for me at the work site. And then obviously for someone's home where they were living in it all the time. And then the last one would be environmental impacts. And this is kind of where each individual, uh, has their own politics around it. Um, this, this kind of ego products, which a lot of it is fairly greenwashing these days because companies like to say they're eco because it gets them more sales. Um, the other one is sustainability and there's all kinds of, uh, different ways to measure that. Um, this is the, one of the things I really liked about natural building was that it's, you're kind of using the the idea of a bird's nest, which is a, a company that I got to work with a little bit, uh, Robert and Paul Laporte, uh, they're called EcoNest, 
and the nest being this like the most sustainable way to build something is to be like a bird and only build from materials that are within a blast radius that you can collect yourself a little bit harder in tiny houses um, because they do have to drive down the road and a lot of these kind of structural elements of the lumber and stuff uh, it's not possible but uh, it's one of the reasons this cabin's hilarious it's got cedar bark and and uh, fur bark as the as the wall lining which is kind of hilarious um then we've got salvage or upcycle. Maybe that's your thing, or that's the way that you can impact um, sustainability and feel good about your build. Um, and what else? Yeah, I think these are the main environmental in impacts. Yeah, okay. So the first one is uh, we're getting into this, like the building stage here right away. And the first stage is the foundation or the trailer. And since we've got some extra time, I might actually pull up a SketchUp model and, and zoom around to describe this a little more um, as I blabber on. But uh, we'll do that after, I think. So we'll come back to this kind of slide and I'll talk about the air gap and I'll give you a 3D explanation, which is much easier. But uh, we've got bugs all over. <laughs> we've got these bugs all over the place, flying ants. Um, so the thermal bridging, apart from the trailer frame, we'll get back to that, um, is steel stud versus uh, wood frame um, or stick frame. Um, so steel studs obviously are going to have a heat transfer from the outside to the inside of the building. Um, so if you've got minus whatever, let's say a, a freezing temperature outside and then nice livable temperature inside, which in in uh, celsius is 21 degrees and fahrenheit i think it's about 72 or something like this um but basically we've got um this temperature differential from outside to inside now a steel stud is going to transfer that outside temperature inside right away it's uh that's the thermal bridge it's bridging that cold to hot or in the other direction as well if you're down in uh, florida or somewhere so the way that we're dealing with that more and more especially on the roof in, and companies that do use steel studs is we've got a layer of outsulation outside of the of the stud stud wall, um, which is a really nice way to stop that thermal bridge, or at least to reduce the temperature on the outside, so it has it's not transferring as much uh, temperature through. The problem with it is when you've got this heat transfer, it also has a what's called a dew point, which is a whole another area of study. But at some point through that transfer, it's going to drop moisture. And the last thing you want is to have moisture in your walls. Um, wood has a more even uh, temperature difference. Wood is, uh, has an R value. Um, I think it's one R per inch. So it's not insulative, um, but it also doesn't transfer the heat from inside to outside so quickly or evenly. Um, so that also means the dew point um, isn't really in the wood either because the temperature is only is transferring so evenly from a cold side to a hot side. It's kind of a tough one to explain, but uh, if you're using steel stud, I guess the advantages are it's going to be more lightweight. If you really want to use spray foam, then that's what you'd use spray foam on, on steel stud. Uh, I think I talk about that in uh, insulation, but we don't we don't use spray foam on wood. Um, the other advantage of steel stud is that if you're in an area that has white ants, termites, um, then you're protected from that. They can't eat the steel. Um, but you do have to put an outsulation layer. I know that a lot of people use the zip system as the wall uh, exterior sheeting and consider that an outsulation. It's not bad. It has some uh, R value, uh, but uh, we use wood personally. Um, that's where we are. We're in the Pacific Northwest. It's all spruce pine fir. And so that's our material of choice. Uh, it also works better for, for insulation bats, which is again, what we prefer to use over, over uh, spray foam. Um, so yeah, that's our choice wood. Um, the other one for thermal bridging is to try and avoid plumbing and exterior walls, um, freezing and sweat. There's obviously situations where we have to come through the wall for exterior uh, faucets and come in, for in our case, underneath the, the trailer frame to come bring up 
services in. Uh, but we're trying to reduce that those areas as much as we can. Um, I don't think it matters where you are anymore, but uh, in in North America or, or anywhere really that even, I mean, Florida had a freezing situation, what was it, a couple of years ago? And the amount of cleanup was just insane because um, it's always assumed that it's a warm place, so people run plumbing in their exterior walls. Um, it's to be avoided. Um, popped lines in your walls is kind of a nightmare. Um, and I see here anything else. Just going to come back to this other screen here and see if there's any questions. Nope. Okay. I'll keep going. Oop, pardon me. What I'm going to do quickly is just do a screen share of a SketchUp model that this will show the trailers that we use. This is our standard trailer, uh, the standard trailer design that we use. Some of the elements are that we go for a straight, uh, generally eight feet wide only. Um, you'll notice that the fenders are also flush at the eight foot mark here. And what that does is we can put a frame on the outside and then our house wrap can come down and we can cork it to the trailer frame here and now we've got positive drainage all the way through our plane we don't have this situation which you see quite a lot which is the fender and everything in the top of the fender and it has to go somewhere these fenders are generally flat so if you imagine a pool of moisture right here on the fender then it wants to go this way and that way and the bead of corking there just isn't good enough, in my opinion, to get that moisture. So if you're doing a tiny house build, then get the foundation right from the get-go. Um, the other thing that our trailer frames have is we put the cross bracing at the bottom. And what that lets us do is it lets us put plywood in. And sorry that I'm looking up here, but that's where my screen is for sharing. Um, what do we got here? That's a terrible screen to dimensions. Can't even read it. Three quarter subfloor, half inch ply. It's a bit of a funny color. Oh, there we go. Now I actually should change this because we're not using this plywood so much um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because it's pressure treated. So it's full of chemicals. Pressure treated lumber's um, great <laughs> in the sense that it uh, it uh, can deal with moisture quite well. But it does the chemicals in pressure treatment aren't ideal. Um, also, the cost of lumber's gone through the roof, as most of you might know. Um, and also, it was um, we're reducing weight by not using this. So maybe what I'll do is see if I can change just that layer. Um, paint bucket, wood. Let's see what we've got here. We'll do a pattern on it. Uh, let's go with the square pattern. Whatever. Let's go that one. And then we'll just make it a bit smaller to show what we're actually doing there. Good enough. So we're, what we're doing is we're using wire, mouse wire. So we're using stainless steel mouse wire as our first layer. Oh, how about I do this side as well? I'll leave it like that. But... What this does is it gives us better breathability. It's really lightweight. It's protecting better against rodents coming into the into the subfloor. Um, it's cheaper, and I think it's a better solution for what we're trying to achieve here. Um, what I'm going to do actually is use this 
as a uh, the top layer here. So we put mouse wire in first over the top of those cross braces under here. So mouse wire. And then over the top of that, we put uh, Mento, Mento 1000, which is a product from a company called 475. It's a, it's a breathable membrane. Um, it's a house wrap, and we use it over the whole rest of the building as well. So then we line, we actually wrap it up and over the top of our floor joists and all the way around so that we've got a, a complete air barrier between our outside here and where we're going to start laying in the insulation. So this is how we start up our trailer build. First thing's mouse wire, and then we've dropped the Mento in and wrap it up like a present. Uh, the next layer after that is our floor joists. And so what we do, and now if you can imagine that the Mento is running up and behind this floor joist, so that's also helping with that, that thermal bridge of the metal, the cold metal to the wood. So it's not sweating through the wood and then breaking the wood down. And all we do is we just lay this in two by four along our rails, along our trailer steel, and we screw it in in an engineering pattern up and down all the way along our rails. And we use self-tapping metal drill bits. Uh, it's Again, we're not having to pre-drill into our thick trailer frame. We can just use a self-tapping uh, screw to go right into there. Um, much easier and faster. So we'll put our two by four there, two by four there. Now in the base here, we've got a, it's a, it's a little higher. So any trailer that's going to be 20, I guess 26 feet is the cutoff. So if it's a 24 foot trailer, then the, the trailer frame should be six inches. And if it's, and it can go up to 26 and that, and then we're starting to get into a weight issue of the, how the trailers are different. Um, if it's 26 and above, then our steel trailer frame is going to be eight inches. So it'll be a two by eight. So what that means is that's how thick our floor joist is that we're going to put in here because it needs to take our subfloor. So once we get them ripped down, um, then I guess the point is we're on the thermal bridging, not trailer. I kind of went off some, on some trailer tangents there, but I'm sure it's useful. What we're doing to avoid that thermal bridging is that we're setting that joists, our joists that are attached to the trailer, we're setting them a half inch up from the steel. So that means we've got a, we're stopping this cold steel touching our three quarter inch subfloor, which I can put in here pretty easily. You can see the gap. You can see that none of our three quarter inch subfloors touching the trailer frame. Now we do end up with this space, this half inch gap all the way around the outside. And so what we put in there is a half inch pressure treated, unfortunately, but much less of it, rain screen. So if we take that subfloor back off, we've got this perimeter all the way around in as our floor joists and our subfloor goes on top and then we screw down our top plate and i know that i'm getting into a little bit of builder stuff here so i just want to check the questions loretta i'm not a builder and you don't know what mento is yes mento <laughs> um mento is just a it's a brand name of a, of a product that we use as a building wrap um so there's the equivalent in regular building would be uh, Tyvek or something like this. It's just a, it's a, it's a membrane that we have wrapped the houses in. Is your trailer composition exclusive to your builds? Um, there's been, our trailer manufacturer has gone and they're selling these trailers as, as well. I mean, we sell on their behalf as well, but um it's not exclusive to my builds. I sell trailers to uh, a couple of other tiny house companies. So they're using the same similar system. If I have done trailers that have gone up to Alaska and in that case, I do switch it up a little bit. I will put these, uh, or I have put the, the ribs 
flush with the top. Um, and that's because um, in the case of uh, insulating a steel structure, then I then we have used spray foam. So if we're putting the steel up inside the insulated space, and then it gives it's much easier for us to spray foam from underneath. But yes, generally this is our system because we're not using spray foam. And I'll get into the spray foam thing a little bit more in the insulation bit. Um, good one. Thanks, Deborah. Now, what else we got here? Insulation. So that's how insulation lays in. It'll be right up to the cavity. This is just what I have. This is a, an insulation layer that I can maybe push up a little to show that. Um, so yeah, that's the next stage there. Actually, it's not quite true. Our next stage is going to be laying in the services. Now this, this way of doing the services, um, it works for us for sure. If you're going to a really cold climate, then it also does work, but you have to skirt underneath the tiny house, which is a whole, um, it's kind of a pain to do it, but, uh, when you've got the services, this is this is the equivalent of putting services in an exterior wall. It's just not a wall, it's a floor. So we do need to skirt all the way around the trailer and then condition that space, as in have some sort of heating system um, to keep this these water lines from reaching freezing temperatures. It's not such a big deal with our drainage, putting this way. But and the reason is water is should be just flowing through there and not sticking around. Um, so it's it, it's not going to freeze, certainly not as quickly. Um, but when you've got a pressurized water line in that space, it is going to be prone to freezing. We keep it right up as far as we can. Um, so we've got as much insulation. Let's see if we can still see it. We've got as much insulation underneath it as we can. And so it's interacting mostly with an interior heated space. Um, it's just going to be a, a three-quarter layer of subfloor and then a floor above that. Um, and then we just have to mark it really well on our uh, on our subfloor so we don't drill through it when we're installing our walls, etc. But this is basically what we're doing. We've got a trailer that just got pulled into the workshop uh, yesterday and uh, on Mon yesterday, yeah. So on Monday, the guys will put this whole floor situation in minus the insulation and then our plumber comes in and does all of this and we usually give him a day and then after that we get straight into doing this and that so with this system and and the reason that we do it is there's a bunch of reasons that we do it but with the wire and the mento and the floor joists essentially we can get our whole trailer sub floor um ready in one day and the plumber's another one day after that, and then another day to get the, well, not even, another few hours to get our uh, plywood subfloor done, and then we're away to the races. We can start building our walls and everything right away. So we're three days in, we're able to start actually building building, a, building the structure, which is nice. Um, what else do I have there? Yeah, so it'll look like this when we're building our walls. Without the P-traps and whatnot, we'll just have our services sticking out where they need to. And this is a regular toilet, a composting toilet, obviously isn't going to have this. Um, sometimes I'll put those rings in and just send them straight through. Um, if someone does have a toilet in there one day. Oh, good one. Hippo. Desiree, you're onto it. Let me go back. Uh, yeah. So there is these things. They're called HEPFO filters, uh, HEPFO waterless P-traps. So this is standard P-trap, and I'll just, since I've got some extra time, I'll go into it a little bit. So if we imagine the water's coming down here out of the kitchen sink, and then it's going to flow up and around. Now in here, there'll just be a reservoir of water. So let's go, let's see if we can do it. Click, click, click. No, it doesn't want to do it. But this will be full of water all the time. This is inside our insulated space. So I like using these, or I don't mind using these. And what the water sitting in that space does is it stops the gases from septic coming back up through 
and the smells coming into your kitchen sink. So that water is purely just for that, to stop the smells coming back up. So that's a P-trap. Now, the ones that we use in the floor are these HEPVO, and you can H-E-P-V-O. You can just have a look um, on uh, Amazon or whatever for for what they are. I think they're worth like $30, something like that each. But essentially, it's a waterless P-trap, so it does the same job as this kitchen one. It's just that the water coming down out of the shower here, it'll run through that, and all it is is a bladder. So if you think of uh, the water can just run this way through, and then the gases can't come up because it's it's a it's a an actual orifice or like a uh, a plastic uh, opening that closes on itself. Um, so that's the pretty much the best or only solution if you're going to have a uh, if you need a peach up in the floor. And again, for a shower, it's it's pretty nice. Um, because it's still sitting quite, it's, it's still got space to be in our floor system, whereas a P-trap would come down and usually where the water is going to be pooling or the, this, this area that they, uh, that the water needs to sit so the gases don't come up is right down low near your, near your freezing space. So it does keep that up and it's waterless anyways. Uh, you can see the profile of it. it. We're able to have enough height here that we have, still have slope on the rest of our plumbing coming out now i think i saw that giovanni yeah do they fail they do and they can um they don't always fail that's for sure i've only heard of it uh once and i heard it from another tiny house builder um the way they fail it's not catastrophic basically the this rubber membrane that's inside that's that's opening and closing as the water's running through it depending on what kind of uh, soaps and shampoos and stuff you use, um, it can lose that seal or the, the, the rubber. It needs to sort of stick back together as it opens and closes. And I think some soaps and stuff can, uh, can wear that down and it doesn't, it doesn't seal so well. So it's not that it stops draining. It's just that um, gases can, can get back up. So I th believe he told me that uh, the easy solution is to include it in yearly maintenance of uh, running some oil down there or WD-40 so that that rubber can make sure that it keeps sticking to each other. Um, we don't install them directly below the bathtub. Usually we set them off to the sides so if they do have to be replaced or something, they can. Or, again, because it's just wire underneath, you can dig it out from the underside. It's not nice, but that's that's life. We can't make everything accessible. Um, the alternative is just to run it straight out, running run your plumbing straight out underneath underneath the house, so that you don't have any pieces like that inside your floor. It just means that you'd have to condition this space even more because you've got water inside what would be a freezing temperature at some point. Okay, I love these questions coming in. Makes it easy to answer them at the same time. The difference between a composting toilet and a non-composting toilet is a, a regular toilet that you'll see everywhere in every house is is a is a non-composting toilet. It means that it means that all of the pee and poo is just going straight into um, either city septic lines or a septic system that you have uh, on a property, say. So everything's together and everything just leaves the building at one time. Whereas a composting toilet, there's a few different types. Um, the one that I like to use is called uh, separate. Now the separate part of it is that it's got a urine diverter in it. So the urine uh, goes to gray water and gray water is going to be water from your shower, your kitchen sink and washer dryer, your washing machine, whatever. That would be considered grey water, and urine is fine to go off with that, and and go into uh, whatever system it is that you're going to drain that to. And then the solids, uh, in the case of a separate toilet, go into a bucket, and then that bucket has to be changed out. And you're putting it in as into a humanure um, system, so 
you'd be composting your own waste. The nice thing about having them separate, uh, the urine and the solids, is that it doesn't smell. So sewage generally is sewage when you've got pee and poo together, it smells. As soon as you separate pee and poo, it just does not smell as much at all. Um, so you, the urine that's going off to grey water is is being diluted by all of the other water systems in your house, by your shower and everything, so the urine smell disappears. And then solids, uh, the the composting toilet that I the separate that I use has a fan in it, and the solids, um, the fan creates a draw through the system, and it's vented out the top of the tiny house, and uh, it essentially crusts over, um, and there's just almost no smell. It's like a regular toilet. Um, people that are using composting toilets and have a human ear system um, that are being more uh, considerate about or intentional about how they do it would after they've done their number twos, they'll be putting sawdust over it anyways, which makes your human ear system a bit more dynamic. Is it easy to change composting toilet to regular toilet or vice versa? Or to build a tiny house and one of the options for either? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the option for a regular toilet is this, is this toilet flange right here and they're really easy to install. Um, if you are going to change it to a composting toilet after the fact, usually it goes the other way. You'd have a composting toilet installed and then a regular toilet it gets changed out to when you move to somewhere that has a septic field or whatever that is. Um, but a composting toilet does need to have a connection to this gray water. So it would be just a case of running another line in and separating these, these out. It's pretty often these days that I'll have two outlets. One would be grey water and one would be the a toilet flange. Um, and I do that whether I've got a regular toilet in there or a composting. Um, it's these cho The toilet flange is a three inch ABS pipe generally. It's regular drainage pipe for plumbing. And it's just easier to send them straight out than do it turn inside that small uh, foundation cavity. Um, yeah, hopefully that's answering the questions for everyone. Uh, always easier to put in all the wall breaks at the building, toilet, flange, composting toilet. Yeah, cover your options. Sure. Uh, the composting, the separate is like 40 number twos, I think, something like that. Depends on all kinds of stuff. Um, but the nice thing about them and the reason that I use them is because they're big enough for to take a volume of like kind of a general household without having to empty it every week. Um, some of the other brands, uh, they're, they're nice and small, um, but they have this, they don't have that much capacity. And so um, the separate also feels a bit more like a regular toilet and looks pretty good. Separate, uh, separate toilet is the name. Okay. I think that's pretty good. Separate. Let me see. Oh, you guys can Google it. Or maybe someone can put it up there for me, a link or something. Um, trailer. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything on our trailer that we do. Um, we also do use pretty solid steel over the fenders with a cross brace through the middle. And if it's a three axle, we'll do two, two cross braces so that uh, we don't have to use as much structural lumber above. Or if there is a um, door here, we don't have to put a f uh, such a huge uh, uh, beam underneath it so we can keep the door a bit lower. It's also just nice to have strong fenders, I think. There we go. Thanks, Loretta. Loretta's got the answer up there. Tapson, you're here. <laughs> Awesome. Your tiny house is almost finished. Um, okay, let me get rid of that and I'll get back to the presentation. Unless there's any other quick questions. I think that's good. We got into all kinds of other stuff there. Okay, so now we'll jump into insulation. And here are just some examples of insulation that uh, I like, I guess. We've got uh, mineral wool, which is what I'm mostly using. Wow, time's flown. Thanks. Um, 
so that's uh, mineral wool. The reason I like to use that is it's it's really stable. It sits up in the wool nicely. It's easy to cut and it doesn't slough down, which wool really does. Um, as much as I love wool as like premium insulation product, um, it's difficult to install. Um, like I said, as much as I love wool, it's diff- difficult to install in walls. Um, where you've got a flat surface, like a floor or a roof, it's really easy to lay it in and it just sits there nicely. Um, but hanging it up in a wall, um, you have to staple it, which means you're compressing your insulated space and it just doesn't, it just doesn't really insulate as, as well as mineral wool. Mineral walls, uh, because it's just extruded minerals, rock, essentially. Um, it doesn't require the same amount of uh, fire retardant and stuff that uh, fiberglass and, and and these other insulations uh, use. It's also super available. It's just as available as fiberglass, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of that stuff. Uh, hemp bats, I've just got it there as a, yes, please, one day this will be more current. Um, I'm sure they're available, but all of the hemp stuff just seems to still be in the R&D phase it's not it's not as readily available i haven't used it i've used some hemp fiber on natural buildings but not as a bat then there's wool then there's wood fiber this is a great outsulation um, um you can see he's putting it over the top of a, of a, of a rafters there for a roof um so that's a that's a board that's similar to like rigid farm except it's made out of wood fiber and then straw bale if you're doing a if you're doing a natural building, um, perfect. Straw bale is amazing. Um, if you're in the Pacific Northwest or pretty much anywhere these days and you're going to do a hybrid uh, building, then you'd put straw bale on the north wall. So you get a super insulated, nice, uh, thick, insulated north wall. And then the south wall's going to be windows and maybe cob or something like this. And I know there's some jargon in there, but I'm going to just keep going through. Uh, so here's some other kinds of insulation. The SIPS panels, uh, structurally insulated panels, uh, that's the top left there, that's um, sandwiched between OSB plywood, generally, and then uh, you've got a, a foam in between. It's amazing. I mean, minimalists use, the, use that system on most of their builds. It's, it's really, it's a great, it's a great product, um, especially for cold climates. Uh, it's certainly not um, non-toxic. Both those materials uh, have got um, different different kinds of <laughs> formaldehydes and glues and all that stuff in them. But um, it's uh, I've never actually built anything out of SIPs, but I, I'm pretty impressed by what it can do from some of these other builders. Um, fiberglass that that's pretty horrible stuff. Cheaper though, um, it's slightly less insulative than the rock wool. It's also lighter, so it's got its place. It depends on where you want to spend your money, um, as far as creating a healthy home goes. So I'm not I'm not averse to fiberglass if it means that we're reducing the cost a little bit of build, um, and then we just take good care on our interior membranes so that we're not having to interact with it too much. She should probably be wearing a mask. Um, spray foam is pretty horrible when it's in with wood and i think of i think i talk about that a little bit after um reflectix uh is the one on the bottom left there you people you see people using that in van conversions and this and that it's not actually actually that insulative if you look at the specs on it then i don't even think they give you an r value um but it does it does uh it does reflect the the temperatures in either direction quite well I don't use it on tiny houses. And then EPS is uh, expanded polystyrene. Um, and that's just a regular foam board. Again, it's not breathable. Most of the things that I'm trying to use in a healthy home are breathable. Um, so SIPs, Reflectix, um, Spray Foam, EPS, EPS are not in that category. Okay, here's my little spiel on spray foam, and I don't want to freak anyone out here too much. But when we use, or when spray foam is used on wood, um, what happens is spray foam is a dead material. Um, so 
once it's sprayed on there and it does its thing, it expands and, and, and chemically hardens pretty quickly, um, which is great. If you're using it on a trailer frame, a steel trailer frame, steel is also dead. And so you've got a nice stable group of dead materials doing their job. Um, I've got a shipping container office that I've been working on for a little bit. And we definitely spray foam the inside of that so that we didn't have that steel sweating on the inside. I've also got a van conversion that I'm just doing for myself. And I will be spray foaming a thin layer of, of spray foam around that again, because it's a metal the, the gel of the van is metal and spray foam is amazing at creating a, a zero air gap onto the metal, which then stops that sweating from happening. So I'm not saying that it's all bad, um, but I don't, and I, I don't really like using it with wood. And the reason is wood expands and contracts through the seasons. Everyone knows about doors getting sticky in winter and then they dry it. Then they, the moisture leaves that wood in the summer and the door opens and closes freely. And so each of those studs you see in the picture there have expanded and contracted over the winter, summer seasons. Now, when they expand, they're pushing that foam out, which is getting harder and harder or more rigid um, all the time. And so it's making that foam crack. And so this story of, of spray foam being a vapor barrier, um, it is, but maybe only for one or two seasons. Um, at which point you've got micro cracks on each side of all of your studs. And this is where moisture is being released to when that stud contracts again in, su in summer. And then the moisture has nowhere to go. Uh, the micro cracks, not, it's not giving enough air gap for the, for the moisture to be released. So it starts breaking down the spray foam or rotting out the wood with the moisture. So this is, uh, this is my spiel on spray foam. Um, obviously the spray foam companies don't like that and people who build primarily with spray foam might not like that. If it is the option because of, because of your builder or your climate or whatever that you want to use, what I would suggest is using a vapor barrier anyways. So instead of just spraying that spray foam in the cavity and saying we're good because the company says that it's a, a vapor barrier as well. I would just put a vapor barrier on so that when that, when that, uh, when it starts to break down and crack, you're able to try and, uh, keep that off gassing, um, to the moving to the outside instead of to the inside space, kind of a tough one, maybe a little bit controversial, but, uh, this is where I'm at. Okay. Now I'll hopefully take care of some of the jargon of uh, membranes and vapor barriers and this and that. The image there on the left you see is the one that we use. Um, it's called Intello. Um, we buy it from a company called 475. Um, it's spelt out 475.com or .ca if you're from Canada. Um, and so this is a breathable uh, vapor barrier. So the idea with it being breathable is that um, if there's moisture in your walls, then it's able to breathe it through the walls and out. So your whole wall system, um, doesn't get, uh, if there's moisture that's inside it, it doesn't just have a chance to start rotting or creating mold. Um, the difference or the best analogy that I, that I use for it is if you imagine that you're going to, you get a, a dollar store rain jacket and you put that dollar store rain jacket on, you go for a five kilometer run or five mile run, you're sweating on the inside like crazy, as opposed to getting like an Arcteryx or some fancy running brand uh, uh, jacket to wear when you go for a run. And at the end of that run, sure, you're sweating, but you're not drenched on the inside. Um, the image there on the right is a standard vapor barrier, which is just solid plastic. It doesn't breathe. And so the moisture that's created on the inside of the house can hit that uh, plastic and it will just drop to the baseboards. Um, anyone who's done renovations and stuff in the past would probably notice that there's mold behind baseboards on houses that have just got a plastic vapor barrier, depending on the size of the house and the climate and all of these things. But as a rule of thumb and as one of our like go to every tiny house build has the Intello breathable vapor barrier. Um, it's, uh, it's my, uh, go-to 
Isn't Tello similar to Membrane? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's a few around now. It's not just Intello. It's just that I've got good deals with those guys, and and I like the company 475, and I like to support them. Okay, so that's that. I'm just being... Yeah, there's the baseboardy example. So yeah, if you do have mold, clove oil is quite good. It actually eats through into the spores a little better than straight up bleach. Um, another way to avoid mold, and because mold is one of the main things that we're trying to create buildings to just never have mold, um, is to get a dehumidistat, or sorry, a humidistat, which is essentially instead of having a switch for your fan, just a regular light switch in your bathroom, um, it's a switch in the sense that it fits a Decora style um, switch, but it senses moisture in the air and it will just turn itself on. So if you jump in the shower and you forget to turn the fan on, this thing will just turn on by itself. Or if you've got a whole bunch of people in the house, or if you're cooking and boiling water or doing canning or whatever it is that you do that's creating moisture, um, that humidistat will just turn on and start getting that moisture out of the house via your uh, bathroom fan. So that's that. Yes, they are wonderful. Okay, Windows. And I'm starting to feel the pinch of time. <laughs> uh, we generally don't use aluminum windows as much. You can buy thermally broken ones, um, which means that there's uh, a few different layers in the profile of the of the mold and there's insulation in them. So uh, aluminum is pretty good. Um, as long as they're thermally broken, which steps the price point up a little more. Uh, wood is great too. It's just that it's expensive, really expensive these days. It's uh, it's one of these crafts that seems to be disappearing a little, um, which means there's less people doing it, which means the price goes up, the cost of lumber and all the other things. Um, they do require maintenance though, um, in the sense they need to be refinished and this and that. And so this is one of these eco sustainable blah blah um trade-offs for us um is that we generally do use vinyl vinyl is not the most eco product by by any sense or means but it is cost effective um, um it's a really it's a really great win window for an airtight uh installation because the, the flange on the installation of it um is able to be taped off and it's all integrated into the same material, which is vinyl. So the whole thing's like that. Get triple glaze for, for really cold climates. There's obviously a cost and a weight uh, thing to consider there. Um, sometimes if you're getting triple glaze windows and your walls only a two by six, then you're not, it, the thermal advantage isn't actually uh, increased. Triple glaze is really nice um, if you can deal with it. Um, but doubles usually fine. Um, so that's the window bit. Now the other one is propane appliances. There's been quite a few, and it's probably just my feed, and because I mention it, and then Google bombards me with information about that. But uh, there's been more articles that I've seen lately around burning propane indoors um, for cooking and and this and that. So there can be can some consideration around that as far as as far as our cooking appliances go because they're generally not vented directly um, if you are getting a hot water system um, that wants to be on demand propane then i would suggest looking for something that's direct vented um, which means the combustion air is being pulled from outside and then it's also being exhausted from the outside as well um, it's just a it's just a way that we can keep our indoor air quality a little better. Uh, the other one is that uh, burning propane does generate a bit of moisture. And I haven't really gone into this so much uh, because generally the decision between propane and electric is um, is uh, is got to do with your like uh, what you have available as far as power sources. Um, but if you're getting really into like a, a really healthy home and, and this and that, then maybe avoiding propane is something to research. Um, Tams and you've put electric heat 
under my floor tile, presumably no EMF, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's no or zero EMF, Tamsin, and I think I'm going to talk about EMFs in a second here. But uh, we did the research on that together, and that was the best one that we could find as far as uh, the least the least uh, EMF. I'm going to get. I'm going to start flying through this because I'm running out of time. This is the system that we use for uh, for our heat recovery. This is the lungs of the building, basically. So there's two fans um, that we use. This is a regular size house with graphics, and they've got a bunch of these around it. If we just imagine this one room being a tiny house, then we've got a fan at each corner. Usually I'll try and put one high and one low. It depends on the layout of the tiny house and all that stuff. But as one of these fans is breathing out or pushing air out, the other one is pushing, pulling air in. So we're creating cross ventilation. Now the warm air that's being pushed out of here, you can see it's red. It's heating up this coil over here. It's like a porcelain baffle. The air that's coming from inside out, it's warming up that baffle. And then after 70 seconds or so, this fan will change directions and it will start pulling the air from outside in. So as that cold air from outside moves through, it's picking up the heat that we've just used from our indoor air temperature. It's picking up this heat and pre-warming that air as it's coming into the house. And the efficiency on this is pretty amazing. Um, the Lunar standard is 90%, I think a little higher, and then the short is 84, which means we're not just blowing air out of our building that we've spent time or wood or energy to heat um, it's quite efficient and so this is what's creating the fresh air in the house or making sure that our indoor air quality matches our outside air quality another one to look at is um, really taking care of the moisture that's underneath our lofts um, and above our showers so here's an example of a shower that we put in. And what we've done is we've put, uh, um, we just had some sheet metal bent up and we're putting it in this angled space at our shower. It also gave a location to put our fan, which there's a, a bit of room here for the fan and the ducting heading out. And so all the moisture or any moisture that's raising up in the shower from steam is going to run down that metal and then it's bent here. It's bent just across here so that moisture doesn't run into the fan as well. And then it's bent down the back so all of that moisture is running back down and into the tub. The other tiny roof truck deck and we use clear silicon cork across each of those joints above our wet areas so that the moisture can't just travel right through your floor system and up into your bedroom or mattress or this and that. Um, the image here on the left is from New Zealand. Um, New Zealand has uh, quite a few differences in their building code and trailer design and all of the stuff. So um, our friend Bryce, uh, who's got the Living Big in a Tiny House channel, uh, YouTube channel, which everyone here I'm sure is familiar with, um, most of his videos have been from New Zealand at this point uh, because of the pandemic and him not being able to travel so much. Um, and so, so many people have been messaging me about tiny house designs from New Zealand and this and that. And there's a real challenge in getting these two to meet up. But one of the things they do use in New Zealand quite a lot is that image there on the left. It's called a shower dome. So you're actually com creating a complete dome around your around your shower area, which is great to mitigate moisture in there. Um, and just make sure it's not spreading around your tiny house. Same again for moisture control in the bedroom. Uh, this is the reason we have bed bases. Um, so if you do have a subfloor that's actually uh, got a cavity, then one way to do it is just to cut that cavity out so that you've got some ventilation around your mattress. Anyone who's been camping knows that underneath your mattress in the morning is wet. And it's the same in a house. Um, so if you don't want your mattress to mold out and uh, these kind of things, even though we've got these short three to four foot lofts, we still have to try and get some sort of bed base up there. Uh, so that's that. And I'm really running out of time. 
Here is some electromagnetic frequency coming from a Wi-Fi router. So try and keep your router at least three feet away from where you would generally be. If that's your desk where you're spending most of your day, or if that's your bed where you're sleeping all night, just try and keep your router as far away as possible. Or turn it off from time to time. Turn it off at night time. Um, that's that. Hard to cover it all in one hour. I know, Zach. Is this it? We've got three minutes left. <laughs> uh so this is what we do in our tiny houses um underneath the bed we'll put led lights so these are um if they're 12 volt dc they're just not going to emit as much electromagnetic frequency the emf is mostly coming from ac currents and you're going to have to look into some of this stuff yourself because i don't have time but if you've transformers under there and led lights then the transformers are emitting emfs right into your bed space so on all of our drawings we say please keep electrical wiring away from the bedroom space especially the pillows and then the lighting underneath at least um, is going to be in dc lighting system like this and also a warm white is really nice and we're getting pretty close to the end here i think salvage materials habitat's great I don't know about the US, but the 31st of each month, they have, or well, the 30th of each month is 30% off. <laughs> so go in there and find out what you want to buy and then go back at the end of the month and get 30% off it if you're building your own stuff. Um, I love just going through what they have. And then another material, another place if you're really getting into the biology of your building is uh, the Red List. And uh, it's the Living Building Challenge has a great list there of non toxic building materials. Okay, we made it with one minute to spare. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Arena. Uh, yeah, and thanks again to Zach and Jason for organizing everything. Um, if you've got any questions about any of this stuff, feel free to send me an email. Give me a chance to get back to you because these days I'm getting quite a few. Um, I've got uh, our website's just been updated a little bit more recently, so go check out some of our builds. Um, hi Tamsin I'll talk to you this week and thanks very much everyone okay take it easy bye okay there you go yikes <laughs> just see if... I know I'm just having a look at the comments See if there's any burning questions there. Thanks, Rebecca. I think everyone's going to slide on over to the next talk. There's still 42 people there. Pretty great. I have built with Cobb. I know I'm still alive, Zach. Should I get off and let the other speakers do their thing? I will. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye.